My wife and I founded the brewery back in 2010 along with another couple uh, local to Rolla, Missouri. And the idea was at the time to bring this kind of new styles of beer and this new kind of passion that we had for craft beer into a community that, that really didn't have a lot in, the, in those offerings. And so we didn't really have a lot of food when we started. We did a little bit of charcuterie, so some meats and cheeses and, and the like, and we tried to source it locally because we thought that would be more fun than, you know, just getting anything you can get off of the, off, off the, sh the store shelf. We started building these relationships with them where we were trying to build up a little partnership. Plus then we get the benefit of having locally raised and sourced ingredients, right? So we bring that in. We try to incorporate that into our menu as much as we can, but it goes even further than that for us because we do manufacture a product and we also have our own farms. And so sustainability becomes a really big piece of this, right? A lot of our spent material that we use um, will either go back to those farms in one way or another. So the, the grain that we use uh, to make the beer, that, that material actually goes back to those farmers and they'll be using it for feed to actually raise the next generation of cattle. Any of our other solid and semi-solid waste that we have actually go back into composting for our vineyards. For us, it's kind of just that full closed loop and trying to keep that as close and tight as we can. So again, that definition got a lot broader and will, I hope, continue to get you know, more broad as we bring more people into the fold. When the pandemic hit, it really did change my whole perspective on this and that we always thought that we were just, you know, being good neighbors, right? And, you know, we're friendly to our neighbors and, we're, and we like our neighbors. But what ended up happening during the pandemic is the world and everyone in general saw really how long a supply chain is, right? And they had no concept of this. And this became very, very terrifying to people. And we started panic buying and we started doing all of these crazy things. And it really started putting a lot of strain on, on, the, on the supply chain and on the, on the whole system, right? And the food system in particular. And I don't think people really understood where their food came from. And now all of a sudden, they're getting a lot of information thrown at them. Well, for us, what happened was we were really not affected by it. And the reason that we weren't, and this has nothing to do with, and I told my staff this, that 10 years ago, when I sat down and met these farmers and started doing business with them, I had no idea that there was gonna be a global pandemic that we were gonna to have to try to get through together, right? I just wanted to have you know these guys in, involved in our in our relationship. During the pandemic, you know the, these these were the first people that came to me and said, "Josh, what do you need? How can we help you?" You know, and and prices didn't go up, prices didn't go down. Um, but so not only were they able to help us and keep our you know our doors open and our supply chain going, but we were able to help them because these are farmers now that the, one of the big issues was is they couldn't get their animals processed, right? They couldn't go to the processing plants because they were so backed up. Well, we were able to, when they did get in, take all of their product and, and offset that cost and that worry for them. So it was, a, it was a really nice duality that happened is that we both helped each other out. And again, I didn't really see the, how big this was, that it was much bigger than just myself. These were all of these other families that we were supporting. And then they were able to keep our lights on and help us support all of the 100 plus families that we have, you know, that work for us. So it got a lot bigger, right, all of a sudden. And still romantic and still cool, and I still love these people very much, but, um, you know, it, it, it got deeper, for sure. Good afternoon and welcome back to Engagement Week. I'm Sarah Holtine Massengale, State Extension Specialist in Community Development and a member of the MU Extension Food Systems Network. This morning and all week this week, we're hearing about the big picture, sweeping global challenges around climate change and its impact not just on food production and distribution, but also on economies, countries, security, and survival. But you also heard a lot of opportunities too. And then if you listened closely to the video or participated in the food, health, and environment session yesterday, you probably heard the words partners, relationships, working together, and that's the key to this session to right now, collaboration. We wanna bring it back to the importance of the work that we can do right within our own communities and within the state of Missouri. By building connections and collaborating throughout the food system, we can find innovative solutions to these big global challenges and opportunities. So let's take a step back and look at the food system, which is all the steps and sectors that are needed to get food from the field to our plates. So I wanna do a quick survey to see who we have in the room today. 
So as I ask these questions, would you audience members please give me a show of hands? And for those on the live stream, drop us a note in the chat with your comments. So are you ready? Who has worked on a farm, grown a garden, hunted for deer, or picked apples at a you-pick farm? All right, some food producers in our midst. What about roles in food marketing or food safety? Has anyone delivered pizza or ordered from DoorDash, stocked grocery store shelves, or picked up snacks for a meeting? How about any farmer's market vendors or shoppers out there? Do I see any? All right, great. We've got marketing, distribution, and purchasing experience in the crowd. What about who's waited tables or been a chef or served school meals? All right, a few of you too, that's great. Food service and preparation is a valuable experience. What about um, anyone who's butchered meat or canned salsa and green beans? Food processing experience, wonderful. Um, what about garbage collecting or a custodian? Does anyone compost food waste at home or at work? How about any donations to a food pantry? Okay, the, sur the surplus sector is represented today too. And finally, if you prepare meals for your family, have attended a community potluck dinner, have a family food tradition, or simply eat food, let's raise our hands, right? So our food system includes all of these experiences, jobs, people, policies, resources, and interactions that are involved in getting food from the farm to our plates. And what does the show of hands tell us? We all participate in the food system in multiple ways, professionally, personally, in our communities, through church, family, traditions, volunteerism, and much more. Which means we all have something to contribute as we work on solutions to the challenge, challenges that were highlighted earlier today. These challenges that are facing our food system are complex, and one single technical solution isn't going to be the answer. Instead, it will take all of us contributing our individual and community strengths and experiences, and then work across our networks to build resilient food systems in Missouri. This partnership circle at the center of our food systems graphic is critical, and we want to focus now on how MU Extension and other organizations around the state are collaborating, using collaboration as a strategy for success in their food system work. Before I introduce our other guest speakers, I want to share a little about the work of the MU Extension Food System Network and Planning Team. Some of you may remember that this group started in 2011 as the Metropolitan Food Systems Team with a goal of providing Extension Food Systems programming in urban areas of the state. As the team has transitioned um, through the years, today we operate as a broad network open to anyone interested in all areas of food systems work. The network is guided by a planning team made up of a group of faculty across disciplines, and you can see the current members of the planning team on the slide. Our network envisions strong and resilient community-based food systems across Missouri that create positive economic impacts, enhance food access, and increase food security for all Missourians. We do this by creating a more informed, connected, and well-resourced network of partners. Our network focuses on food systems topics that require multidisciplinary approaches. We facilitate collaboration and training that leverages the collective knowledge and skills of not just MU Extension, but the MU Interdisciplinary Center for Food Security, our UM system campuses, Lincoln University, state agencies, growers, businesses, and community members. All of these partners are important for this work. Some highlights of our efforts We've created a food systems webpage within MU Extension that serves both internal and external audiences as a one-stop shop to find resources across all the sectors of the food system. We have an email listserv to share resources and improve communication. We host monthly network collaboration calls. I'm a slide off. <laughs> but there we go. A little nervous up here. <laughs> um, we host monthly network communication calls open to anyone interested in food systems work to share updates, meet new partners, and explore opportunities for shared programs and research. We create and host professional development and statewide training on a range of food systems topics. Past work of the team has included developing the Stock Healthy, Shop Healthy curriculum, 
and we host the virtual Selling Local Foods workshop annually. We also respond to requests for support, such as when last year, two team members created the water testing decision tree to help county offices better communicate with clients when they have questions about water issues. Going forward, we are building a partnership with the MU Interdisciplinary Center for Food Security and targeting our work across three main impact areas. The first is community capacity, where we're working to develop community leadership and vibrant social infrastructure um, through programs such as Missouri Eats, which is a community-led planning process. Our second impact area is community-based food systems. This work supports our enhanced equity and fairness in the food system, building individual, business, and community wealth, and ensures that communities can respond to food system disruptions. Finally, food and nutrition security. This is focused on support for applied research and programs with on-the-ground partners and community partners such as food pantries and master gardeners. So we welcome new partners in this work, so feel free to reach out to any of us to learn more. You can scan the QR code here to sign up for our listserv or check out the attendee hub on Cvent for this session for more information and resources. Now I'm pleased to be able to highlight the other examples of this kind of interdisciplinary systems level work that's currently helping to address Missouri's food system challenges across, on the ground now across our state. We hope this work will help um, us think about other innovative ways to build more resilient food systems in Missouri. Our next three speakers will use the Ignite format, 20 slides, 15 seconds per slide, for a total of five minutes for each speaker. It's a quick dive into their great work, and it's a challenge to put these kinds of presentations together. If you'd like to learn more, after the presentation, our planning team and the three guest speakers will be out in the lobby, and we'd love to continue the conversations about their great work. First off, we'll welcome Jennifer Lutz, a field specialist in agriculture, business, and policy from McDonald County. Then we'll welcome Juan Cabrera Garcia, state specialist in horticulture, who works jointly with MU Extension and the University of Missouri, Kansas City. And then finally, Donna Martin, Public Health Program Manager at Mid-America Regional Council, will share our final Ignite presentation. So let's welcome Jennifer Lutz. Thanks, Sarah. As Sarah mentioned, I'm Jennifer Lutz, and I co-lead the MU Extension Value Added Meats team. I'm happy to be here today to share a bit of our story with you. It's a story that started during the pandemic. In 2020, the pandemic led to meat shortages across the country, which brought awareness of the fragility and of our meat supplies and just-in-time ordering. This was something, as Marshall mentioned earlier, that our country hadn't seen in a very long, long time. Due to empty supermarket shelves, people turned to local livestock producers and small meat processors to try to fill the gaps. But the meat processors were quickly overwhelmed, which created long wait times and often appointments were scheduled a year or two out. Missouri was quick to support the small meat processors in order to improve food supply resilience and funding expansions of new equipment that would expand processing capacity and promote worker safety. This grant, however, had a very quick turnaround time in which plant owners had to learn to do things they have never done before, and there were many steps needed for them to need, that they needed to complete prior to submitting their grants. Along the same time, a new partnership was formed between MU Extension and the Missouri SPDC which encouraged extension specialists to offer a more personalized business assistance. To begin this work, I reached out to the Missouri Association of Meat Processors and offered to assist producers as they navigated this grant. I wrote articles that were distributed by the MAP network with deadlines, reminders, and an offer of personal assistance. The calls and emails started coming in, and I realized very quickly that I didn't have the capacity to help everyone. And that is how the Value Added Meats team came together and why we started working together. But what has held us together over the last two years are the bigger needs that we've learned about while working with processors. An immediate need that surfaced for processors moving from custom exempt to inspection was a need to develop their own HACCP plans. 
These are very detailed plans for how a plant will work to ensure that food is safe for human consumption. Kyle Whitaker, co-lead of the Value Added Meats team, quickly learned how to write these plans, and he worked with the meat processors and the Missouri Department of Ag to make necessary changes and ensure that the HACCP plans were accepted by the inspecting agencies. Initially, our team was able to assist 44 processors receive over $5 million in grant funds. We also assisted 11 plants as they moved from custom exempt to operating under inspection. But we haven't stopped there. Thanks to the support that we've received from Dr. Mallory Ray, our team has furthered our knowledge by attending the Western Meat School, where we learned all about how to sell meat locally. Uh, Mallory also supported our group when we saw the need for more public guidance to ensure that customers understand the process of purchasing and processing an animal locally. She assisted us in publishing our first guide sheet, which has been well received by producers, consumers, and processors. She worked with her team on campus to design social media posts and highlight the new guide sheet and the work our group is doing. And she has sought and received grants that will further support our work in the future. Our work is gaining momentum and soon we'll be working with the new Ag Innovation Center where we will further our relationships with producers as they navigate selling meat direct to consumers and create additional value in their meat products. This work will help improve supply chain resilience here in Missouri. This momentum will continue as we partner with Dr. Wiegand and Zach Callahan and bring meat education across the state with two custom designed hands-on learning trailers that participants can learn about food processing and supply marketing. We've also partnered with the Missouri Feedlot School to teach producers the nuances of selling beef direct to consumers and we'll work with DAS as they update Missouri Ag Intel. While our team started out assisting meat processors with a new grant, our work has expanded to encompass both producers and consumers. We're working to ensure a strong, safe supply of meat for Missouri for many years to come. And our team is spread across the state, but soon we'll be closer to you as we reach out across the state and provide education. And I just wanted to say thank you to the Missouri Food Systems Network today for giving us this opportunity to come and tell us about your story. And now I invite Juan to the stage. Right. Um, hello, my name is Juan Cabrera. And as you heard earlier from Sarah, I work both for MU Extension and UMKC. Uh, with MU Extension, I'm the state specialist for vegetable production, and with UMKC, I'm a research assistant professor in controlled environment agriculture. Um, today, I'm going to begin my uh, presentation with the commercial video newsletter, uh, which was uh, an in initiative that began with the field specialist. Uh, and what we do with the video newsletter is first um, help the specialty crop industry in Missouri grow. That's the first um, objective. The second objective is to connect growers with resources in the state. Uh, so this initiative was built as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic when we had to shift our gears towards how we can keep engaged with farmers in the region. Um, I thought there was a QR code there for you to re register to the newsletter, but I think I skipped that in the presentation. Sorry about that. So we had an interdisciplinary team of um, specialists contributing to this, and we're building a video library. Um, videos formats ten, no more than 10 minutes, uh, so we keep our farmers engaged. Second is the MU Sembrador team. This is a Hispanic outreach program that we have in the state of Missouri. And we have had several webinars on how to grow uh, specialty crops in Missouri um, aimed towards Hispanic in Missouri. The reason why we're doing it is because the, um, about 5% of the population in the state is Hispanic. And if you notice at the bottom there, the number of farms is in decline in the state, but when you look at um, ethnicity, you see that the number of operators, um, Hispanic operators, uh, are increasing. Um, these are the counties that we have targeted or that we've been able to reach with our uh, efforts in the state. Um, we also had had domestic participa participation in the, in the Spanish webinars from different states, and we also had international uh, participants attend our uh, webinars. 
We had had a lot of uh, support from partners, um, alianzas from UMKC, FCS Financial, Kansas City Community Garden, The Giving Grove. Uh, we also had partners from uh, St. Louis, like LifeWise St. Louis, uh, and Urban um, Harvest in St. Louis. Um, basically, what are, we do surveys, and our particip participant tells us that they use, the international participants tell us that they use their, our programs to develop local programs for uh, people in their countries. And this is an example of some, uh, of a program in Nicaragua. Uh, one of the participants developed a program to teach women in Nicaragua how to be self-sustaining and grow their own vegetables. And those are pictures from that program. Um, challenges that we had with Hispanics in Missouri is that most of them, they don't have inter um, an email address and this becomes problematic with registering to our programs uh, through CIVENT. And most of them learn from face-to-face -face interactions. That's how they were, became aware of our programs and not um, social media interactions. The commercial agriculture webinar, we're teaching growers how to grow specialty crops in the state. And the purpose is to encourage um, beginning farmers to establish new farms, but also establish farmers to diversify their production. Um, these are the counties that we've been able to reach um, farmers in the area. And mostly, um, most of the participants that we had, they state that they, went, they attended the webinars because they want to begin a new career in agriculture. And thanks to partnerships with uh, the BFRDP program and the MOSER, we were able to offer scholarships for beginning farmers. Um, most of them, um, of our participants, uh, they use direct -to sales marketing. Um, and they say that their major challenges uh, refers to finding labor, uh, keeping records, uh, getting uh, certifications, access to land and resources, and how to scale up production. This year, we did the 2022 Specialty Crop Business Management, and this is as a result of the surveys that we did in the previous webinars. Our participants tell us that they want to know more about how to manage the specialty crop farm business. And here we had a huge collaborative efforts with different um, specialists from the ag business side. I'm not an ag business specialist, but we are leveraging their expertise to teach our uh, beginning and established farmers in the state to become better at managing their farm business. And last uh, but not least, we have an initiative with UMKC where we, we got a beginning farmer rancher program grant, and we're teaching veteran farmers how to grow crops indoors using controlled environment agriculture uh, with UMKC. And the purpose is to teach them how to uh, grow these crops, uh, hydroponic crops and mu indoor mushrooms, so that they can seek a career in agriculture or in STEM um, areas. And this is a horticulture team, a wonderful team that I like to work with every day, um, and I'm just giving a shout out to them. Thank you. Hi, my name is Donna Martin, and I am the project director for Double Up Food Bucks, which is a healthy food incentive program giving SNAP recipients greater access to fresh fruits and vegetables. The program is offered at farmers markets, farm stands, mobile markets, and grocery stores in Missouri and Kansas. Our program is based off of a national model which strives for three main outcomes, families buying and consuming more healthy food, local farmers making more money, and a greater portion of our food dollars staying in our communities. Most SNAP respondents surveyed indicates that food does not last long. They do not have money to purchase more food, and they can't afford to eat healthy meals. This food insecurity leads to poor health outcomes like heart disease and diabetes. Farmers markets use a token system for any plastic payment like credit card, debit, and EBT cards. When SNAP customers purchase SNAP tokens, they get double up food buck tokens that can be spent on fresh fruits and vegetables only. At grocery stores, SNAP customers get the incentive when they buy fresh produce. Some stores tie the incentive to a loyalty program or give it as a coupon. Others provide the incentive as an immediate 50% discount. At farm stands and mobile markets, the incentive is given as a 50% discount. Like the other locations, the maximum incentive amount that can be given is $25 per day. The Double Up, Food Bu Double Up Heartland Collaborative includes multiple Missouri and Kansas partners. 
Staff from these organizations meet regularly to implement the program. Responsibilities include administration, reporting, communications, evaluation, and coordination. The collaborative needs many layers of partners, however, to work and be successful in a system affected by a vari variety of outside pressures. We are going to walk through the layers to explore the complexity of this work. Participating farmers, markets, and grocery stores are the first layer critical for the program. They are the places connecting SNAP customers with fresh fruits and vegetables, and they contribute a great deal of data telling us how things are going. This map shows the geographical scope of the program across the two states. The green dots are grocery stores and the orange dots are farmers markets. The collaborative partners help locations get set up to offer the incentive in a variety of ways. All locations are required to offer locally grown produce options. So they rely on the next layer of partners, local fresh fruit and vegetable producers. The program needs the general community and specific community partners to be involved as well. The broadest way is to support the locations offering the program. Encourage stores and markets to take SNAP and be welcoming to SNAP customers. Point new, new locations to the Double Up Food Buck website to, an, to get an application. And if you can, help them connect to local growers or community funders who might help with ongoing costs and needed improvements. The community can also help the program connect with SNAP recipients. Community partners that work with people who receive SNAP benefits are invaluable because they often have trusted relationships with those they serve. Community partners can distribute the Double Up Food Buck brochures and refer people to our website where they can learn more. Our website has a link to a map that helps SNAP customers find the locations closest to their home. Double Up Food Bucks has made an Im a positive impact on SNAP recipients. Over the last seven years, nearly $6 million of Double Up Food Bucks have been distributed, and of that, over $4.8 million has been redeemed, and nearly half of that in the last two years. The process, the program is increasing the amount of produce being consumed, lowering the amount of junk food people are eating, and Double Up Food Buck participants are less likely to report experiencing food insecurity. Farmers markets and farm stands report an increase in money being made while selling more fruits and vegetables. They have a new and more diverse customer base and more repeat customers. Grocery stores have received positive feedback from their customers and employees and the program helps call attention to their locally grown items in the produce sections. We hope that the Double Up Food Bucks program is one element that, that keeps stores and farmers markets strong in their community. Thank you so much for allowing me to share information about the Double Up Food Bucks program and the may, many people and programs and partners that are involved. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, Juan, and Donna for your presentations. When I asked them to distill their great work into five minutes and talk about systems and collaboration, they kind of looked at me like I was crazy, but they did a great job. So maybe we can give them another round of applause. A lot of their links to information, the QR code that Juan mentioned, um, if you go to the CVent Attendee Hub, you can access all of that information there and their information if you'd like to reach out um, for more questions. So their examples really highlight the positive impacts that can happen when we put together expertise and strengths of people from different disciplines, regions, and experiences. They showed how taking a systems level approach to address these issues improves lives through better food access, stronger businesses, and more resilient community economies. Their work also shows the layers of support and participation that are needed from all of us, no matter our work role or our connections in our community. We need to bring all of those to bear on these issues. This morning, Mr. Arnott said that the focus on um, I'm going to get hold of them just a second. <laughs> Mr. Arnott said that the focus on trust and transparency means that we need to engage in dialogue. So we're, let's get started with that. For the next 10 minutes or so, I'd like you to interact with someone near you 
preferably someone that you don't know, and discuss the uh, questions on my next slide. For those of you that are joining us on the live stream, if you'll take some time to reflect on these questions and the examples that you know in your community um, and think about those there, there's a QR code on question three so that you can submit your answer to that question, those of you in the audience and on the live stream. You'll see the results on your phone and we'll be using the information that we collect here to help with, we host our network meetings and plan for program development over the next year. So here are your question prompts for the next 10 minutes. Introduce yourself and share your favorite food, then discuss what innovative efforts are already happening in your community and how you might support those. And then what is Missouri's highest priority food system challenge or opportunity? I'll give you a two minute warning when we're about to wrap up the conversation. So go ahead and discuss. I hope that you had the start of some really good conversations and I'll ask that you keep these going this week while you're here on the live stream or as you work in your communities and in your organizations with partners that you keep reaching out and meeting someone new so that we can leverage each other's strengths. So our goal with this session today was to highlight that we need to find solutions that focus on the food system, not just a single sector or program. And that means finding ways to collaborate across the partners and the sectors to bring our expertise and experience together from many dis different disciplines and partners. That's what will help us turn these big, complex food system issues into opportunities and make, pro make progress towards resilient community food systems in our state. We hope if you're interested to continue these conversations as extension or as partners throughout the state, that you'll join us for one of our monthly network meetings in the future. Remember, the network is a shared learning opportunity to connect as much or as often as you'd like, to learn more, to share your work, or explore opportunities in Missouri to work on food systems. If you'd like to be part of the network, um, you can scan the QR code here to sign up for our listserv. We'll also have information available on the Engagement Week attendee hub, where you can view the recordings and access those additional research resources from our speakers. For those of you that are here tomorrow, please plan to join us at 1015 at the Extension Strategy Session and find a spot at a table with a topic of interest for some creative visioning about how Extension can strategize and plan for our food systems work in the next year. And then on Thursday, we'll hope you'll all join us again virtually as we take a deeper dive into food security during the All Things Missouri live stream session. In just a minute, I'll welcome Dr. Stuart back, who will share a very exciting announcement to wrap up this session. But first, a few reminders. After Dr. Stuart's announcement, there will be a half hour break. If you'd like to connect with any of the members of our planning team or the guest speakers today, We'll be out in the lobby and we're happy to visit with you and chat more about all of the work. The next session begins at 3 p.m. here in Jesse Auditorium. And with that, I'll welcome back Dr. Stewart. And didn't they do a good job? Wasn't that good? Let's give them a high hand, yeah. Uh, a lot of great stuff, and I love those Ignite sessions. I just think that's a whole new way of doing things. I'm learning things every day. I don't know if I could talk that fast, uh, being from where I'm from, but i got to learn that, so we'll, we'll try that sometime. But uh, thank you, Sarah, and I do want to thank Sarah in particular for her leadership. Uh, obviously, it's a passion for her, and she's been working with this group, and let's just give Sarah a big round of applause. She deserves that. Good work. As she said, uh, we got a lot of work to do in this space, and I really believe, in fact, today had just personally, so you can know this, had lunch with Charlie and with Jason and some others, and one of the things that Jason left us with to think about is he, and he didn't know we were doing this necessarily, but he said, you've got a real opportunity in this food systems piece. He said, there's just so much you can do in agriculture food, nutrition, as it relates to this, and he sees this as one of the real areas to move into. Now, I was really glad to hear him say that, because what I'm getting ready to announce, so it's not like a well-kept secret or anything, uh, but we're going to announce this officially today, that we are in partnership with Lincoln University announcing a new food systems uh, position. It'll be a statewide specialist position to work in this area. Uh, we're working out the details now, 
And what it will mean is that we're in partnership with them. As you know, Lincoln University has many great things that they do in research and innovation around specialty crops and some of those areas as well as many of our faculty do. So you can look forward to that. And we hope to have that on the street sometime in November. So look forward to that. We're glad, as Dr. Choi talked about, we're hiring people. So if you know of people who might be interested as we get that out, uh, let us know. Uh, Dr. Kallenbach, uh, Dr. Higgins, and our colleagues at Lincoln University are working on that. So you can give a round of applause for getting a new position out there. We're excited about that. I also want to make mention of a fact that one of the groups that I have the privilege of working with at the University of Missouri system level is something called the Missouri 100. Uh, the Missouri 100 is a group of great supporters of the University of Missouri system. Uh, they advise the president and work with him on a number of issues. They do advocacy for us. They have actually helped support things for this week before. And this year, we went to them with an idea to give dollars to help support one of the biggest needs that we have in the university. Uh, many of you may not know this, but there are really two big issues that every institution in America are facing. One is food insecurity uh, for students. Uh, you may not think about that, but a lot of students come here and are food insecure. And because of that, like at Mizzou, we have a food pantry, the Tiger Pantry. You'll go on any of the four campuses, you will find a similar operation. Uh, and so this year, the Missouri 100 uh, was willing to step into that and provide $10,000 to each of those campuses to help support their food pantry. So let's give the Missouri 100 a big round of applause. I did mention that there are two issues, and I want to say this, and this is something just for awareness. Uh, we're glad to have you on the campus today, those of you that could be with us, whether you be here or be on one of the other campuses, we're delighted that you could be a part of it. Uh, there are really those two, these two issues, the food insecurity, the other one is student mental health. Um, and it's something that all of us need to be really aware of. Uh, it has continued to worsen, if you will. Uh, both of those issues have, they are not disconnected. There is an overlap in some of that. So as you say that, you know, you come to a big institution, you walk around the campus, you see all the wonderful things. I think it's always important to keep that in the back of our mind that there are many students who are here doing their very best, but they're suffering from those two issues. And I'm really proud of the work that MU Extension, the University of Missouri, University of Missouri System, our sister campuses are also doing in that space around food insecurity and mental health for our students. <laughs>